The mission of supporting the offensive of the Stalingrad Front's shock force and building up an exterior perimeter of encirclement from the southwest was allotted to the 51st Army, including General T. T. Shapkin's 4th Cavalry Corps, which was to attack southwest in the general direction of Abganerovo and Kotelnikovo. The troops of the Stalingrad Front were to be supported by the 8th Air Army under the command of Major General T. T. Krukin. To prepare the counter-offensive, enormous movements of troops and materiel were effected for all the fronts, especially the newly organised Southwestern Front. One must give credit to the General Staff and the staff of the Red Army Logistics Division for the brilliant way in which they coped with massing the forces for this operation. A total of 27,000 lorries were employed to transport troops and freight. The railways carried 1,300 freight cars daily. Troops and supplies for the Stalingrad front were carried in the exceptionally difficult conditions of the autumn ice drifting on the Volga. Between the 1st and 20th of November alone, more than 200,000 troops, over 2,000 guns and thousands of tanks and other military vehicles were moved to the front. As a result of the large-scale operation and the victory achieved on the battlefield, it would be appropriate to note the remarkable organisation and efficiency of our rear services. Without their painstaking work, the rapidity of this counter-offensive would have been impossible. We should not overlook the difficulties the Soviet commanders experienced in organising their own operations. It should be noted that the enemy also had to take into consideration the situation and the defensive actions of its forces. At the start of the counter-offensive, the Germans were surprised and they were completely unprepared. Nevertheless, the prompt reaction of the enemy command made it possible to hold the front in the initial phase of the Soviet counter-offensive, although gradually, as Soviet forces pushed back the German units, the tide began to turn. But of great importance in the operations that followed was the consistently correct manoeuvring of Soviet forces. The commanders showed remarkable skills in the organisation of the operations and troop management. Our troops conducted operations with speed and decisiveness, as was especially seen in the actions of our mechanised forces. The events at Stalingrad brought about a drastic change in the course of the war. The victories won by Soviet forces at Stalingrad and the losses the Germans sustained in this operation became a source of deepening morale among the nations of the anti-Hitler coalition and had a considerable influence on the military and political situation in the world. To Comrade Konstantinov, if air support preparation is unsatisfactory in the armies of Yeremenko and Vatutin, the operation will fail. Experience in fighting the Germans shows that operations against them can be won only if we have superiority in the air. Therefore, our Air Force must carry out the following three assignments. 1. Concentration on the offensive area, suppress German aircraft and provide our troops with reliable cover. 2. Systematic bombing. Open up the field for our advancing units by systematically bombing the confronting German forces. Three. Pursuit of retreating enemy forces. Pursue retreating enemy forces with systematic bombing and assault actions to achieve complete disorganisation and prevent them from digging in on the nearest defence lines. If Novikov believes our air force is currently unable to carry out the above-mentioned missions, advise temporary suspension of the operation and a build-up of the air force. Talk to Novikov and Vorozhaikin, drive this point home, and notify me of your general opinion, Dot Vasiliev. Four o'clock, November 12th, 1942. Having finalised the details of the Stalingrad Front operational plans by November 12th, Vasilevsky and I telephoned Stalin to say that we needed to report personally several considerations related to the pending operation. On the morning of November 13th, we saw Stalin. He was in a cheerful mood and asked us to detail the state of affairs at Stalingrad, and the progress being made in preparing for the counter-dash offensive. Our report covered the following main points. In discussing the qualitative and quantitative balance of forces, we pointed out that on the sectors where the southwestern and Stalingrad fronts were to strike the main blows, units of the Romanian armies were still engaged in a defensive operation. We learned from POW interrogations that the overall combat standard of the Romanian forces was not high. 
In these sectors, we would enjoy considerable numerical superiority, provided the Nazi command did not regroup reserves by our offensive zero hour. Thus far, our intelligence had not discovered any signs of regrouping. Paulus's 6th Army and part of the 4th Panzer Army were tied up at Stalingrad by the troops of the Stalingrad and Don Fronts. Our forces were massing in the designated areas according to plan. As far as we could judge, the enemy was unaware of our regrouping. We had taken steps to envelop all movements of troops and materiel with the utmost secrecy. The missions assigned to the various fronts, armies and formations had been finalised. On-the-spot coordination of operations between all arms of the services had been dovetailed. The details of the planned link-up between the shock forces of the southwestern and Stalingrad fronts had been ironed out with the respective commanders and their staffs, including the commanding personnel of the forces that were to emerge in the area between Sovetsky and Kalach. The air armies would apparently complete preparations no earlier than November 15th. The variants had been developed for building up an interior perimeter of encirclement of the enemy grouping at Stalingrad and an exterior perimeter for destroying the trapped enemy. Delivery of ammunition, fuel and winter clothing was somewhat tardy, but there was every reason to believe that by the evening of either November 16th or 17th the troops would have these supplies. The counter-offensive could start by the southwestern and Don fronts on November 19th, while the Stalingrad front was to begin operations 24 hours later. The southwestern front would begin earlier because its tasks were more complicated. It was stationed far from the kalach sovetsky area and had to cross the Don. The Supreme Commander listened attentively. By the way he unhurriedly puffed his pipe, smoothed his moustache, and never interrupted once, we could see that he was pleased. The Stalingrad counter-offensive operation implied that Soviet forces would henceforth control the initiative. We were confident that the pending counter-offensive would be successful and would do much for the ultimate liberation of our homeland from the Nazi invaders. While we were presenting our report, members of the State Defence Committee and some members of the Politburo came in, and we had to repeat some of the major points we had already covered. After a brief discussion, the plan for the counter-offensive was given full approval. Vasilevsky and I pointed out to the Supreme Commander that as soon as German troops at Stalingrad and in the Northern Caucasus found themselves in a desperate spot, the Nazi High Command would be compelled to transfer some of its forces from other sectors, particularly from Vyazma, to assist the Southern grouping. To prevent this, it was essential to urgently prepare and conduct an offensive north of Vyazma, and first, smash the Germans in the Rzhev salient. We suggested using troops in the Kalinin and Western fronts for this operation. That would be fine, Stalin said, but which of you two will take charge? As Vasilevsky and I had already agreed on that score, I explained, The Stalingrad operation is completely ready. Vasilevsky can coordinate operations at Stalingrad while I take charge of the preparations for an offensive by the Kalinin and Western fronts. The Supreme Commander consented and instructed, Fly out tomorrow morning to Stalingrad, and once again check troop and command readiness for the start of the operation. On November 14th, I made another tour of Vatutin's forces. Vasilevsky, meanwhile, went to see Yeremenko. The next day, I received a cable from Stalin saying, To Comrade Konstantinov, personal. Set a day for the resettlement of Fyodorov and Ivanov at your discretion, and subsequently report back to me upon arrival in Moscow. Should you believe it necessary for either of the two to start resettlement one or two days earlier or later, I authorise you to decide this matter too, at your own discretion. Vasiliev, 1310, November 15, 1942 Vasilevsky and I discussed the matter and set November 19th as the zero day for the Southwestern Front and the 65th Army of the Don Front, and November 20th as the zero day for the Stalingrad Front. The Supreme Commander endorsed our decision. On November 17th, I was summoned to the Supreme Command GHQ to work out in detail the operation for the Kalinin and Western Fronts. At 7.30 on November 19th, the troops of the Southwestern Front struck a telling blow, breaking the defences of the 3rd Romanian Army on two sectors simultaneously. 
This was effected from a bridgehead southwest of Serafimovich by the 5th Tank Army under Lieutenant General Romanenko, and from the Kletskaya bridgehead by the 21st Army under Major General I. M. Chistiakov. The enemy buckled and, panic-stricken, fled or surrendered. German units holding positions behind the Romanian forces mounted a powerful counterattack in an attempt to check our advance, but were crushed by the 1st and 26th Tank Corps. The tactical breakthrough on the southwestern front was now an accomplished fact. Army Commander Romanenko was in his element. A brave man and an extremely capable general, he was perfectly suited to guide such rapid movements. To oppose General Chistiakov's 21st Army, the enemy swung its reserves into action, including its 14th Panzer Division. The 22nd German Panzer Division, the 1st Romanian Tank Division, and the 7th Romanian Cavalry Division were deployed against the 5th Tank Army, and primarily against Major General V. V. Butkov's 1st Tank Corps. Major General A. G. Rodin's 26th Tank Corps inflicted a telling defeat on the 1st Tank Division and crushed the headquarters of the 5th Romanian Army Corps. Some of the men fled panic-stricken, but a large number surrendered. As soon as our forces moved ahead in operational width and depth, the main forces of the 3rd Romanian Army, which had hitherto held out against the southwestern front, along with the German reserves that rushed in to help out, were completely destroyed and, for all practical purposes, ceased to exist. Rodin's 26th Tank Corps and Kravchenko's 4th Tank Corps raced through to the neighbourhood of Kalach to link up with the 4th Mechanised Corps of the Stalingrad Front. The 65th Army of the Don Front, under Lieutenant General P. I. Batov, was advancing to the left of the 21st Army. On the night of November 22nd, Lieutenant Colonel G. N. Filipov's advance guard of the 26th Tank Corps captured a bridge across the Don in a daring raid. Apparently, the German sentries guarding the bridge had been expecting a relief detail and were taken by surprise when the advance detachment of Filipov's forces swooped down on them. The Nazis thought the group was on exercises using captured Russian tanks. When they realised the truth, it was too late. After a brief engagement, the bridge was taken. Though the Germans made several attempts to dislodge Filipov's group, they got nowhere. While holding the bridge, Filipov decided to send Lieutenant Colonel N. M. Filipenko's armoured unit to capture Kalach, which was just two kilometres away. Despite his small force, Lieutenant Colonel Filipenko decided to attack from a march column. The battle for Kalach raged all through the night. The Germans put up stiff resistance, but the valiant actions of the troops in the encirclement compelled them to retreat. Kalach fell into the hands of our troops at daybreak on November 23rd. Thus, a link was established between the southwestern front and the Stalingrad front, which has now turned into a single front. Meanwhile, Vasilevsky had arrived at the headquarters of the Stalingrad front to see what was happening. By the end of the day, our troops had already advanced several dozen kilometres. On November 20th, we were prepared to launch our planned offensive on the Stalingrad front. We would commence the operation with a strong air raid on the enemy front, which had been preceded by a heavy artillery preparation. The 51st Army under Major General Trufanov advanced in the general direction of Plodovitoye and even farther to Abganarovo. The 57th Army under Major General Tolbukin attacked toward Kalach. Supporting the right flank of the 57th Army, the 64th Army under Lieutenant General Shumilov struck out from the Ivanovka area toward Gavrilovka and Varvarovka. When the defences were pierced, and the 1st, 2nd, 18th and 20th Romanian divisions, as well as the 29th German Motorised Division, were crushed, the 51st Army rushed the 4th Mechanised Corps under General V. T. Volsky into the gap forced at Plodovitoye. Meanwhile, in the sector controlled by the 57th Army, Major General T. I. Tanuskishin's 13th Tank Corps went into action. Also rushed into the breach was General Shapkin's 4th Cavalry Corps, which captured the station of Abganarovo on the same day. The enemy responded by sending the 16th and 24th Panzer Divisions from Stalingrad to this sector in an attempt to block the 57th Army's advance on Kalach. However, this movement was belated, 
and lacked the strength to resist the powerful blows being dealt by the troops of the southwestern and Stalingrad fronts, whose armoured units had, by 16 o'clock hours on November 23rd, reached the vicinity of the small village of Sovetsky. There, the 45th Tank Brigade of the 4th Tank Corps under Lieutenant Colonel P. K. Zhidkov was the first to link up with the 36th Mechanized Brigade under Lieutenant Colonel M. I. Rodionov of the 4th Mechanized Corps. Crossing the Don, General A. G. Kravchenko's 4th Tank Corps of the Southwestern Front and Volsky's 4th Mechanized Corps of the Stalingrad Front linked up in the vicinity of Sovetsky, thus sealing the encirclement of the Stalingrad enemy grouping deployed between the Don and the Volga. This enabled the 64th, 57th, 21st, 65th, 24th and 66th armies to press ahead in the general direction of Stalingrad, compressing in a pincer movement the interior perimeter of encirclement of the enemy. In their pursuit of the retreating enemy, the 1st Guards Army, the 5th Tank Army of the Southwestern Front, and the 51st Army of the Stalingrad Front, which had been reinforced with armoured formations, were to hurl the smashed enemy units further back from the encircled Stalingrad grouping and build up a firm exterior perimeter necessary for annihilation of the trapped enemy. This concluded the first phase of the counter-offensive. By early December, the enemy had been firmly hemmed in. At that point, our forces embarked upon the next phase, destroying the trapped grouping. Vasilevsky and the general staff kept me well posted on the progress of the counter-offensive. After the encirclement of the 6th German Army and units of the 4th Panzer Army, it was crucial to prevent an enemy breakout. On November 28th, I discussed the pending offensive with the commanding officers of the Kalinin Front at their headquarters. Late that night, I received a call from the Supreme Commander, who asked me whether I knew about the latest developments at Stalingrad. When I confirmed that I did, the Supreme Commander asked what action I thought should be taken to destroy the Nazi forces encircled there. On the morning of November 29th, I cabled the Supreme Commander. At the present juncture, unless there's a secondary enemy attack from Nizhne Chevskaya and Kotelnikovo, the trapped German forces will not attempt a breakout. The Nazi command will apparently try to hold on in the area of Stalingrad, Vertiaki, Marinovka, Karpovka, and the Gornaya Polyana State Farm. They will also immediately try to mass a shock force at Nizhne Chirskaya and Kotelnikovo to pierce our front in the general direction of Karpovka, thus opening a corridor to supply the trapped grouping and subsequently enable it to escape. Under favourable circumstances, the enemy may prove able to open up such a corridor in the sector of Marinovka, Lyapichev and Verkne Chirskaya, with its front facing north. The other side of this corridor, with its front facing southeast, may run along a line extending from Tsibenko through Zeti and Gnilovskaya to Shebelin. To prevent a link-up of the Nizhnechevskaya and Kotelnikovo enemy groupings with the Stalingrad grouping, and the formation of such a corridor, I suggest the following. Hurl back as soon as possible the Nizhnechevskaya and Kotelnikovo groupings and deploy close battle formations along the Oblivskaya Tormosin Kotelnikovo line. We must have in reserve two armoured groups, each having at least 100 tanks, at Nizhne Chirskaya and Kotelnikovo. The encircled enemy grouping at Stalingrad must be cleft into two. This can be accomplished by striking a cutting blow in the direction of Bolshaya Rososhka, and another from the opposite side in the direction of Dubininsky, height 135. On all other sectors, we must adopt defensive tactics, sending only individual units into action to bleed the enemy white. After the encircled enemy grouping is cleft, we should first destroy the weaker grouping and subsequently strike with all our force at the Stalingrad grouping. Zhukov, November 29, 1942. After submitting my report to the Supreme Commander, I telephoned Vasilevsky, who supported my arguments. We also exchanged views on the pending operations of the Southwestern Front. Vasilevsky agreed temporarily to suspend the big Saturn operation and direct the attack mounted by the Southwestern Front at the flank of the enemy's Tormosin grouping. The general staff held the same view. The Southwestern Front was assigned a mission-coded small Saturn. 
Under this plan, the 1st and 3rd Guards armies and the 5th Tank Army were to strike out in the general direction of Morozovsk and destroy the enemy grouping in that sector. This was to be supported by the 6th Army of the Voronezh Front, which was to advance in the general direction of Kantemirovka. The Nazi command badly needed reserves to remedy the catastrophic situation on the Stalingrad and Caucasian sectors. To prevent forces from being rushed from Army Group Center, the Soviet Supreme Command decided to supplement the counteroffensive at Stalingrad with an offensive operation by the Western and Kalinin fronts against the German troops holding the Hrujev salient. Between November 20th and December 8th, the planning and preparation of this operation were finalized. On December 8, 1942, the fronts were issued the following directive. In combined operations, the Kalinin and Western fronts are by January 1, 1943, to crush the rojev sikovka olenino Bailey enemy grouping and firmly dig in on the line running through Yarigino, Sikovka, Andreevskoye, Lenino, Novoye Ajevo, Dentialevo and Sviti. The Western Front must a. Pierce enemy defences in the Bolshoye Kropotovo and Yarigino sector on the 10th and 11th of December, take Sikovka no later than the 15th of December, and move into the Andreevskoye sector on the 20th of December, no less than two rifle divisions to work with the 41st Army of the Kalinin Front to seal encirclement of the enemy. b. After penetration of the enemy defences and the emergence of the main force on the railway line, turn the front's mobile group and at least four rifle divisions north to attack the enemy's Rojev Chertolino grouping in the rear. c. Use the 30th Army to pierce defences in the sector stretching from Koshkino to the road junction northeast of Burgovo, and reach the railway line in the vicinity of Chertolino no later than December 15th. Upon reaching the railway line, enter into combined operations with the front's mobile force and, striking out along the railway line, advance on Rojev. The Kalinin. Front must a. Deploy the 31st and 39th armies to attack the enemy from Yarigino towards Sikovka. b. Assign the 5th Tank Army and the 1st Cavalry Corps the task of advancing into the enemy's rear in the vicinity of Vladimirsky, and then turning west to link up with the forces of the Western Front. c. Commit all available resources to cutting off and encircling the enemy in the sector from Rejev to Sykovka. Zhukov, December 8, 1942. By December 9, the Kalinin Front had successfully completed its offensive. The Rejev salient was cleared and encircled. Therefore, it formed the new army group Don. General Field Marshal Manstein was appointed the commander of this group. The Nazi leadership considered Manstein the most suitable and capable of all their generals. Army Group Don was formed from the troops moved up from other sectors of the Soviet-German front and partly from France and Germany. We now know that Manstein's plan to rescue the encircled forces at Stalingrad was to organise two shock forces at Kotelnikovo and Tormasin. His plans, however, were not destined to succeed. The Wehrmacht faced an acute shortage of reserves and whatever troops the Nazi command managed to muster moved very slowly along widely extended communications. Besides, Soviet partisans operating in the enemy rear knew why German troops were hurrying south and did all they could to obstruct their movement. Braving Nazi terror and disregarding all German precautions, our valiant patriots derailed dozens of troop trains. Time passed, but the Nazis failed to mass a large enough force for a relief operation and a new defence perimeter. Fearing his Stalingrad armies were doomed, Hitler hurried Manstein to start the operation before the build-up was completed. Manstein initiated this operation on December 12th, but only from the Kotelnikovo sector and along the railway line. His Kotelnikovo group consisted of the 6th, 23rd and 17th Panzer Divisions, a Panzer Battalion of Tiger Tanks, four infantry divisions and several supporting formations, and two Romanian cavalry divisions. After three days of heavy fighting, the enemy had thrust 45 kilometres forward to Stalingrad and even crossed the river Aksai Yesaulovsky. A fierce battle unfolded in the Verkhna-Kumsky sector, taking a heavy toll on both sides. 
But despite heavy losses, the enemy continued to drive forward to Stalingrad. Battle-seasoned Soviet forces doggedly contested their defence lines. Only when the 17th Panzer Division returned and aerial bombardment intensified did units of the 51st Army and General Shapkin's Cavalry Corps retreat across the river Mishkova. The enemy was only 40 kilometres from Stalingrad and apparently believed victory was within reach. But these hopes were premature. In conformity with orders from the Supreme Command, Vasilevsky moved into action the Second Guards Army under General R. Ya. Malinovsky, well reinforced with tanks and artillery, it reversed the tide of the battle in favour of the Soviet forces. On December 16th, the troops of the Southwestern Front and the Sixth Army of the Voronezh Front struck out to crush the German concentration along the middle reaches of the Don and emerge in the rear of the enemy's Tormasin grouping. After defeating the Eighth Italian Army, the First Guards Army under Lieutenant General Sixth Kuznetsov, the Third Guards Army under Lieutenant General D.D. Lelyushenko. By this time, the First Guards Army was divided into two Guards Armies, the First and the Third, and the Sixth Army under Major General F.M. Karitanov, attached to the Southwestern Front and reinforced by the 17th Armoured Corps under P.P. Poluboyarov, raced ahead in the general direction of Morozovsk. The first wave, smashing through enemy resistance, involved the 24th and 25th Tank Corps and the 1st Guards Mechanised Corps. Meanwhile, the 17th and 18th Tank Corps came up on the right, in the neighbourhood of Milarovo. The rapid thrust of the southwestern front in this direction compelled Manstein to bring into battle forces that had earlier been intended to strike from the Tormosin sector in the direction of Stalingrad. Those forces turned against the southwestern front's troops, which were emerging on the flank and rear of Army Group Don. In his December 28th report to the Supreme Command, Vatutin, commander of the southwestern front, covering the progress of the offensive, described the situation in the following cable on the Bodo printer. All forces facing our front, around 17 divisions, have been wiped out and their stocks captured. We have taken more than 60,000 prisoners. About the same number have been killed. The few remaining forces are hardly offering any resistance, except on rare occasions. Ahead of us, the enemy continues stubborn resistance along the Oblivskaya and Verkhna Chirskaya line. Today, in the vicinity of Morozovsk, we took prisoners from the 11th Panzer Division and the 8th Airfield Division, which had previously faced Romanenko's army. The greatest resistance to Lelyushenko's army and to our mobile forces is coming from the enemy formations that moved from the Kotelnikovo sector across the Don to the line extending from Chernyshkovsky through Morozovsk and Skosiovskaya to Tatsinskaya. These troops are trying to dig in to obstruct the further advance of our mobile units and thus give their own forces a chance to retreat. Given favourable circumstances, the enemy may attempt to hold the entire salient with the aim of further rescuing its encircled grouping. He will get nowhere, though. Every effort will be made to cut off that salient. Every day air reconnaissance spots detraining of enemy troops near Rossosh, Starobelsk, Voroshilovgrad, Chebotovka, Kamensk, Likaya and Zverevo. Though it is hard to tell what the enemy plans to do, evidently he is establishing his main line of defence along the Seversky Donets. The enemy is compelled primarily to fill in the 350 kilometre wide breach our troops have made. It would be a good idea to continue to strike at the enemy without affording any respite. However, that calls for reinforcements, as the forces available here are busy finishing up the small Saturn operation. Additional forces are required to initiate Big Saturn. The Supreme Commander and I were present when the telegram came through. This is what Stalin replied. Your primary task is to prevent the defeat of Badenov's corps and send him Pavlov's and Rusyanov's forces for relief as soon as you can. You were right to permit Badenov to leave Tatsinskaya if absolutely necessary. It's advisable to use some infantry formation to bolster your blow at Tormasin with the 8th Cavalry Corps. You were right to dispatch the 3rd Guards Cavalry Corps and the Rifle Division to Tormasin via Suvorovsky. To develop small Saturn into big Saturn, we have already sent you the 2nd and 23rd Tank Corps. In a week you will get two more armoured corps and three or four rifle divisions. 
We have doubts about your plans to send the 18th Tank Corps to Skosirskaya. Better keep it at Milarovo and Verkhna Tarasovskoya, together with the 17th Tank Corps. Generally, bear in mind that it is safer to send two armoured corps at a time on long-range missions to prevent a repetition of Badenov's plight. Then I inquired of Vatutin, where is the 18th Tank Corps at the moment? It's directly east of Milarovo and won't be isolated, Vatutin replied. Keep Badenov in mind all the time. Rescue him at any cost, I instructed. I will do absolutely everything possible to rescue Badenov, Vatutin assured us. We had good reason to discuss the 24th Tank Corps under VM Badenov. Here is what happened. Entering the breakthrough northwest of Bogachar at 18.30 hours on December 17th, the 24th Corps advanced some 300 kilometres, fighting every inch of the way and destroying, en route to the Tatsinskaya railway station, 6,700 enemy troops and capturing a great deal of hardware. Coming up to this station on the morning of December 24th, the Corps swung into the attack from marching orders, assaulting the station from various sides. A group under guards Captain Aya Fomin crossed the railway line Likaya Stalingrad and burst into the station. Mowing down the enemy guard, the group captured a trainload of disassembled aircraft. I very much regret that the brave Captain Fomin was killed in this operation. At the same time, Captain Emi Nechayev's tanks roared onto the airfield, where more than 200 German transport aircraft stood ready to take off and crushed the whole lot under their treads. For five whole days, the Armoured Corps held Tatsinskaya, putting up fierce resistance to encircling enemy reserves. On the morning of December 29th, under orders from Vatutin, the Corps broke out of the encirclement thanks to the men's courage and Badenov's skilled guidance of the battle. They subsequently retreated in full fighting order to Ilyinka. Several days later, this same formation successfully attacked Morozovsk. In token of its signal contribution to the enemy route in the Volga Don area, the 24th Corps was renamed the Second Guards Tatsinskaya Tank Corps, while its commander, Badenov, was the first in the USSR to be decorated with the Order of Suvorov, Second Class. Many of his officers, political instructors and men were also decorated. The successful blows struck by the troops of the southwestern and Stalingrad fronts on the Kotelnikovo and Morozovsk sectors sealed the fate of Paulus's encircled troops at Stalingrad. Having brilliantly fulfilled its task, the Second Guard's army emerged in the rear of the enemy, thus preventing any chance of retreat. The surrounding of the German troops was so efficient that no one could believe Paulus could retreat. However, the full ring could not be closed until after our troops crossed the River Don. For that reason, Vasilevsky ordered the 1st Guards Army and the 3rd Guards Army to carry out their assault on the Don. On December 30th, we launched an operation to eliminate the enemy forces at Kotelnikovo and destroy the remnants of the encircled group. The attack on the German forces in the Stalingrad pocket proved to be a stunning success. According to intelligence received, in the battles between December 23, 1942 and January 8, 1943, German losses amounted to 91,000 men killed or taken prisoner and more than 200 tanks destroyed or damaged. The Soviet troops were compelled to strike decisively and sharply at the German army in order to accelerate their defeat. As the commander of the Second Guards Army, Malinovsky reported in December, with the start of our advance and the build-up of forces, many of the Stalingrad groupings fell back into total disarray, surrendering their last reserves to our advancing divisions. However, they fell short of their objectives. On January 22nd, after additional preparation, the Don Front launched a fresh offensive. The enemy buckled and began rolling back. In the fighting, General Tolbukhin's 57th Army and General Zhadov's 66th Army did remarkably well. This is how an intelligence officer of Paulus's 6th Army described the Soviet-compelled German retreat in his reminiscences. We were forced back along the entire front. Our withdrawal was more like a flight. There was downright panic in places. The road of retreat was strewn with corpses, which blizzards, seemingly out of compassion, soon blanketed with snow. We were retreating without order. 
and further, outracing death, which easily caught up to pluck out whole batches of victims, the army rolled back onto a small scrap of land that was an inferno. The southern group of German forces was snuffed out on January 31st, and its remnants, led by General Field Marshal Paulus, commander of the 6th Army, surrendered. The remnants of the northern group capitulated on February 2nd. The great battle on the Volga was over. A major grouping of forces of Nazi Germany and its satellites ceased to exist. The Stalingrad battle was extremely fierce, one that I personally can compare only to the battle at Moscow. Between November 19th, 1942, and February 2nd, 1943, 32 divisions and three brigades were destroyed, and the other 16 divisions lost from half to three quarters of their effective strength. Total enemy losses in the Volga Don Stalingrad area ran into some 1.5 million men, 3,500 tanks and assault weapons, 12,000 guns and mortars, and 3,000 aircraft, along with large amounts of other equipment. This crippling toll had a telling effect on the overall strategic situation, shaking Nazi Germany's entire war machine to its foundations. What were the causes of the German debacle at Stalingrad and our epoch-making victory? The Nazis' strategic plans for 1942 failed because they underestimated the forces and potential of the Soviet state and the indomitable spirit of the people, and because they overestimated their own forces and capabilities. Skillful utilisation of the surprise factor, correct selection of the directions of the main effort, and accurate detection of weak points in the enemy defences led to the defeat of the German troops in the operations codenamed Uranus, Small Saturn and Ring. Also of great importance was the correct calculation of the required manpower and materiel for the quickest possible breakthrough of tactical defences, as well as full-scale exploitation of an operational breakthrough with the object of enveloping the enemy main grouping. The actions of the armoured, mechanised and air forces were decisive in swiftly enveloping and routing the enemy. The commanders and staff officers left nothing to chance. They meticulously thought out every detail in preparing the counter-offensive. And during the offensive, control of the troops in all echelons was marked by clarity of purpose, firmness and foresight. The party political work conducted by the military councils, political bodies, party and YCL organisations, and commanders fostered in soldiers' confidence and bravery, and encouraged mass heroism on the battlefield, contributing significantly to the enemy's defeat. The Stalingrad victory turned the tide of war in favour of the Soviet Union and launched the massive efforts to drive the enemy off Soviet territory. After the battle, the Soviet Supreme Command took possession of the strategic initiative and held it until the war was over. It was a jubilant, though hard-won, victory not only for the fighting forces directly destroying the enemy, but also for the Soviet people working day and night to provide the army with the wherewithal to successfully rout the enemy. Patriots of Russia, Ukraine, Bielorussia, the Baltic Republics, the Caucasus, Kazakhstan and Central Asian Republics earned immortal fame through their staunchness and mass-scale heroism. Henceforth, enemy officers and generals and the German people generally began showing more openly their aversion to Hitler and the entire Nazi leadership, they realised that Hitler and his entourage had embroiled the nation in what was an out-and-out -out gamble, and that the victories he had promised had evaporated with their troops in the catastrophe on the Don and the Volga and in the northern Caucasus. The Stalingrad defeat, Lieutenant General Westphal observed, came as a deep shock to both the German nation and their army. Never before in all of Germany's history had there been so fearful an end of so large a force. Because of the rout of the German, Italian and Romanian armies in the Volga and the Don area, and later of the Hungarian armies in the ostrogoz rossosh operation, Germany's influence on its allies declined drastically. Discord and friction set in when the allies lost faith in Hitler's leadership and wanted to break out of the web of war in which he had enmeshed these countries. The German debacle at Stalingrad had a sobering effect on the neutral countries, and those still pursuing a wait-and-see policy, compelling them to acknowledge the USSR's superb power and the inevitable defeat of Nazi Germany. 
It is common knowledge that news of the Nazi debacle at Stalingrad prompted jubilation around the world. It was a tremendous inspiration to peoples to further their efforts against Nazi occupation. For myself personally, the defence of Stalingrad, the preparation of the counter-offensive, and participation in deciding the main aspects of operations in the South were of special importance, as I had now accumulated far more experience in mounting a counter-offensive than I had at Moscow in 1941, where limited forces did not permit a counter-offensive with the aim of encircling an enemy grouping. For successful general leadership of the counter-offensive at Stalingrad and the major results, along with others, I was decorated with the Order of Suvorov First Class, number 1. I regarded this decoration not only as a great personal honour, but also as a summons to work still harder to bring nearer the hour of the complete rout of the enemy, the hour of total and final victory. Vasilevsky, Voronov, Vatutin, Yeremenko and Rokossovsky were also awarded the Order of Suvorov First Class. Many generals, officers, sergeants and soldiers also received high government decorations. The successful defeat of the German forces at Stalingrad, on the Don and in the Caucasus, opened the door to a stepped-up offensive on the southwestern direction by all the fronts. After smashing the enemy in the Don Volga area, successful operations were conducted in the Ostrogozh Rossosh and the Voronezh Kastornoye sectors. Soviet troops forced ahead, moving further west and taking Rostov, Novocherkask, Kursk, Kharkov, and a number of other key areas. The overall operational and strategic situation along the entire Soviet German front had swung steeply against the Nazi forces. The Battle of Stalingrad was a real landmark in the campaign of the winter of 1942-1943, an event of tremendous international importance. Once the enemy had been annihilated in the Demyansk area on the northwestern front, our troops advanced to the river Lovat. The enemy was driven out of the Rzhev Vyazma region by the forces on the western front, and the Dukovshchina Spas Demensk line was taken. By the middle of March 1943, the wind of change was blowing in favour of the Soviet Union on all fronts. After the crushing defeat of the German, Romanian, Italian and Hungarian troops in the Volga and Don regions and in the North Caucasus, the enemy, having sustained heavy losses, had withdrawn to the sevsk rilsk sumy aktirka krasnograd slavyansk lisichansk Taganrog, line by mid-March. From the moment the Soviet forces started the counter-offensive near Stalingrad in November 1942 until March 1943, they routed more than 100 enemy divisions. Naturally, these great victories were won at a great cost to our fighters and the Soviet people, for we also sustained heavy losses. A lull followed on the fronts except for sectors of the Voronezh, southwestern and southern fronts, and in the Kuban area, where bitter fighting continued. To prevent the situation of its forces on the southern flank of the front from further deteriorating after obtaining reinforcements, the German High Command organised a counter-offensive on the southwestern front. This operation was to push our forces back beyond the river Seversky Donets, and then, under the cover of the defences, to attack the forces on the Voronezh front and capture Kharkov and Belgorod. As was later discovered from captured documents, if the situation had been in their favour, the Nazi command had intended to step up operations and eradicate the Kursk salient. At the beginning of March, from the Lyubotin area, the enemy dealt a telling counterblow at the forces on the left flank of the Voronezh front. Owing to their losses, our troops were compelled to withdraw. The enemy seized Kharkov again on March 16th and began to mount an offensive on the Belgorod sector. A representative of the Stavka at that time, I was on the northwestern front, which was under the command of Marshal Timoshenko. Having reached the river Lovat, we advanced towards Pskov. I had anticipated that the Germans would take advantage of their successes at Kharkov and seek to deal a further blow to our troops, now newly reinforced and steadily assembling in the Kursk area. A front meeting took place in early April. I then submitted my analysis of the enemy's plans. The German general staff was evidently expecting to launch a decisive counter-offensive against our forces on the southern front during the summer. 
This conclusion was drawn from the fact that German intelligence had developed a full picture of the strengths of our troops there and their forward positions. The enemy intended to mount a large-scale offensive on the Kursk salient with the aim of smashing the defending troops and securing a solid foothold on the left bank of the River Don. That would afford them the opportunity to achieve a breakthrough to the east, capturing Voronezh and encircling our troops in the southern and southwestern fronts. But the Soviet command was determined to thwart these plans. On the night of May 2nd, a meeting of the military council took place in Voronezh. As a result of our discussion, it was decided that in preparing for operations in the summer campaign of 1943, we should not only concentrate all available forces, but also, having accumulated experience from the successful Stalingrad offensive, focus on the area of the Kursk salient. The Soviets decided to combine their defensive and offensive efforts in such a way as to build a defence line and at the same time, if circumstances permitted, to prepare for a counter-offensive. On May 3rd, the Commander-in-Chief issued an order to concentrate forces for defence along the entire front and to prepare a counter-offensive at the appropriate moment. The enemy's counter-offensive began on June 5th with strikes against our troops on the Voronezh front. In this situation, the rear areas of the German forces were again infiltrated by Soviet troops who attacked their rear so as to sow panic in the ranks of the German troops, hinder their communications and diminish their fighting capacity. As a result of a combined operation, the enemy sustained heavy losses in manpower and equipment. However, the German command could not shake off the effect of their miscalculations and underestimated our forces in the sector of the Kursk salient. By the beginning of July, having concentrated the utmost in their forces in the main direction of the attack, the Germans dealt a powerful blow to the Kursk salient on July 5th. Our troops were well prepared and equipped with fortifications. They fought fiercely, inflicting heavy losses on the enemy. The Germans did not take the Kursk salient. This time, despite all their efforts, they were unable to make a breakthrough and penetrate into our lines. They sustained considerable losses, 600 tanks, 800 guns and mortars and 10,000 men. I had moved from Voronezh to the southern front in early June and was directing the defence of the Kursk salient. The enemy could not understand that the more they concentrated their forces for an attack on the Kursk salient, the more difficult it became for them to manage their forces and maintain operational effectiveness. The key features of the operation were the utilisation of the troops' fighting spirit, weapons and rapid manoeuvrability to disrupt the enemy's plans, a new and decisive factor that hastened the onset of our final victory. The offensive on the southern flank was led by the southern front under the command of Army General P.S. Ribalco, which secured the sector between Voronezh and Belgorod. The strategic significance of this offensive was that it linked the southern front with the troops in the Kursk salient and the operations launched on the western flank, enabling us to build up forces and reinforce the whole front. The First Guards Army, under the command of General G. F. Dronov, advanced on July 12th and linked up with the forces of the southern front at Oboyan. This operational manoeuvre laid the foundation for the final push against the enemy, forcing them into an irreversible retreat. The Battle of Kursk ended with the encirclement of the enemy forces in the Belgorod-Karkov area, with the Soviet troops penetrating deep into the enemy's rear. In terms of manpower, the enemy lost 500,000 men. Their retreat was swift and disorganised. The Germans fell back from the line of the Dnieper, ceding large areas of territory to the advancing Red Army. The Battle of Kursk was another turning point in the Great Patriotic War. The German command had lost its strategic initiative. After their defeat at Stalingrad, the Nazis had aimed for a decisive victory to ensure their dominance on the Eastern Front, but they had completely failed. The combination of skillful strategy, effective troop movements and the determination of our soldiers allowed us to achieve this remarkable victory. It solidified the Soviet Union's position as a major military power and set the stage for further offensives that would eventually lead to the defeat of Nazi Germany. As agreed with the Chief of General Staff, Vasilevsky, and the commanders of the Central, Voronezh and Southwestern Fronts, 
we took a series of measures to arrange thorough reconnaissance of enemy positions. Vasilevsky assigned the intelligence division and the central headquarters of the partisan movement the task of discovering the extent and distribution of the enemy's reserves, as well as the regrouping and concentration of troops moved in from France, Germany and other countries. In general, the impact of our offensive operations against the enemy was significantly intensified by the activities of the partisans, which were arranged and directed from the centre through the constant and indefatigable efforts of local underground party organisations. The actions of the partisans were coordinated with those of the regular army, assisting in obtaining data on the enemy while destroying reserves, cutting communications and hampering the redeployment of enemy forces and weapons. In 1942, the Nazis had to deploy almost 10% of their ground forces on the Soviet-German front against the partisans. In 1943, SS and SD police forces, along with 500,000 soldiers from auxiliary units and more than 25 divisions from the army in the field, were employed for these purposes. The Communist Party carefully supervised the patriotic struggle of the people against the Nazi invaders, rendering valuable assistance to our regular forces. Communists in partisan detachments not only took up arms in the struggle, but also did much to politically enlighten the population by circulating leaflets, making appeals, disseminating reports from the Soviet Information Agency, and exposing the mendacious propaganda put out by the enemy. The partisans' efforts significantly undermined the morale of the enemy forces. The forces on the fronts carried out intensive reconnaissance both from the air and on the ground within their sectors. Consequently, by the beginning of April, we had sufficiently detailed information on the deployment of enemy forces around Orel, Sumy, Belgorod and Kharkov. Once I analysed these data, along with those obtained from the wider theatre of operations, and discussed them with the commanding officers of the Voronezh and Central Fronts, and then with the Chief of General Staff, Vasilevsky, I sent the Supreme Commander the following report. To Comrade Vasilyev, 5.30am, April 8, 1943. I hereby state my opinion on the possible movements of the enemy in the spring and summer of 1943, and our plans for defensive actions in the coming months. 1. Having suffered serious losses in the winter campaign of 1,942 40 thirds, the enemy does not appear able to build up significant reserves by spring to resume the offensive on the Caucasus and push forward to the Volga for a wide enveloping movement around Moscow. 2. Due to inadequate large reserves, in the spring and first half of the summer of 1943, the enemy will be forced to launch offensive operations on a smaller front, resolving the task in stages, with the main aim being the capture of Moscow. 3. At the first stage, having gathered as many of his forces as possible, including at least 13 to 15 tank divisions and substantial air support, the enemy will evidently deal a blow with his Orel Kromi grouping in the enveloping movement around Kursk from the northeast and with the Belgorod Kharkov grouping from the southeast. An additional attack on Kursk from the southwest, aimed at dividing our front, must be expected from the area around Vorozhba between the rivers Saim and Sayal. The enemy will attempt to defeat and surround our 13th, 70th, 65th, 38th, 40th and 21st armies, aiming to reach the river Korocha Korocha Tim River Tim Droskovo line. 4. At the second stage, the enemy will attempt to flank and strike at the rear of the southwestern front, generally moving through Valuiki Urazovo. To counter this offensive, the enemy may deal a blow at the Lysychansk area on a northern Svatovo Urazovo sector. 5. At the third stage, after regrouping, the enemy may try to reach the Liski Voronezh Yelets front and, taking cover southeast, may launch an offensive as part of a wide enveloping movement around Moscow from the southeast via Ranenburg Ryazhsk Ryazan. 6. In this year's offensive operations, the enemy may be expected to rely chiefly on his tank divisions and air force, as his infantry is currently less prepared for offensive action than it was last year. 7. If the enemy is to be crushed by our defensive formations, besides measures to build up anti-tank defences on the central and Voronezh fronts, 
we must quickly assemble 30 anti-tank artillery regiments from passive sectors and redeploy them as part of the Supreme Command's reserves in threatened areas. I am not familiar with the final location of our operational reserves, therefore I believe it expedient to propose their deployment in the Yefremov Livni Kastornoye Novi Oskol Valuiki Rossosh Liski Voronezh Yelets area. The deeper reserve echelon should be deployed around Ryazhsk, Rannenburg, Michurinsk and Tambov, with one reserve army in the Tula Stalinogorsk area. I do not believe it is necessary for our forces to mount a preventive offensive in the next few days. It will be better to wear the enemy out in defensive action, destroy his tanks, and then, by taking in fresh reserves, launch an all-out offensive to finish off the enemy's main grouping. Our forecasts aligned with what the Nazi commanding officers intended to do. The orders issued by Hitler on April 15, 1943, read as follows. General Headquarters of the Führer. April 15th, 1943. Top secret, for commanding officers only. As soon as weather conditions permit, I have decided to launch the Citadel Offensive, the first offensive operation this year. Decisive importance is attributed to this offensive. It should be carried out rapidly and with definite success, giving us the initiative for the entire spring and summer of this year. In this connection, all preparatory measures should be implemented with the greatest care and energy. The best formations, armaments, commanding officers and a large amount of ammunition should be used where the main thrusts are made. Each commanding officer and every soldier must thoroughly understand the decisive significance of this offensive. The victory near Kursk should be a torch for the whole world. I hereby give the following orders. 1. The aim of the offensive is a concentrated thrust carried out decisively and rapidly by forces from Belgorod and the area south of Orel to surround and destroy the forces in the Kursk area. 2. It is necessary. a. To take every possible advantage of the surprise factor and to keep the enemy unaware, particularly regarding the offensive's start date. b. To ensure maximum concentration of striking forces on a narrow sector to break through enemy defences, taking advantage of overwhelming superiority in all means of attack in that area, tanks, assault equipment, artillery, mortars, etc., and thereby close the encirclement. For purposes of secrecy, only those whose involvement is absolutely necessary should be informed of the plans for the operation. Thus, having appraised the situation correctly before the German offensive was launched, the Soviet commanding officers had precisely determined the probability and direction of the Nazi forces' manoeuvres in the Kursk bulge area. On April 9th or 10, I don't remember exactly, Vasilevsky arrived at the headquarters of the Voronezh Front. We discussed my report in detail, the prevailing situation, and the plans for the disposition of operational and strategic reserves, as well as the nature of the forthcoming operations. We concurred on all questions. Having drawn up a draft for the Supreme Command Directive regarding the disposition of the Supreme Command Reserves and the establishment of the Step Front, we sent it to the Supreme Commander bearing our signatures. This document outlined the armies and means of reinforcements on the fronts. It was proposed that the Step Front headquarters be established in Novi Oskol, with a command post in Korocha and an auxiliary troop control post in Veliki Boluk. As was always the case in preparing major operations, the front's commanding officers and headquarters were to communicate their considerations and suggestions regarding the nature of the operations to the general staff. As some accounts of the organisation of defences and the counter-offensive in the area around Kursk in 1943 are incorrect, it is necessary to quote from the relevant documents filed at the general headquarters and the general staff. Notably, no other documents were delivered to the General Headquarters. Here is the report from April 10th, sent on orders of the General Staff by the Chief of Staff of the Central Front, Lieutenant General M. S. Malinin, from the Central Front, April 10th, 1943, to the Operations Chief, General Staff of the Red Army, Colonel General Antonov. 4. The objective and most probable directions of the enemy offensive in the spring and summer of 1943 a. Taking into account the forces and means, and importantly the outcome of the offensives in 1941 and 1942, 
an enemy offensive is expected solely in the Kursk and Voronezh operational direction. b. The general strategic situation at this stage of the war favours the Germans holding Crimea, Donbass and Ukraine, advancing the front to the Sterovka starobelsk rovenki liski vorona ZH Sector, using powerful forces to strike at Kursk and Orel. C. The most favourable area for the enemy to deploy tanks in the offensive is from Valuiki to Belgorod. D. Their grouping in the first echelon consists of six, seven armies, including tank and motorised divisions, with an objective to break through our defences along the Orel-Kursk sector, surround and destroy our forces, and strike northward toward Orel-Kursk and finally to Moscow. Upon analysing this report, I gathered that the command at the Central Front believed the enemy could gather the necessary forces for a decisive blow. Thus, the defenders were entrusted with assembling their own reserves. The general intentions of the Central Front Command aligned with our proposals for deploying reserves along the proposed lines. To ensure better coordination, it was agreed to maintain direct communication with the fronts and hold consultations regarding possible courses of action. Thus, a difficult stage awaited us, both in organising the defences and coordinating the activities of the various branches of the armed forces. Having properly understood the nature of the enemy's intentions, we did not allow ourselves to be distracted from any of the measures vital for the realisation of our plans. We fortified our positions, ensuring good communication among them and gathering sufficient forces for our counter-offensive. To reach the desired outcome, I constantly insisted on the need to adjust the organisation of defence forces and deploy artillery in adequate numbers on the sectors threatened by the enemy. Vasilevsky, his deputy A.I. Antonov and I spent the whole day on April 12th preparing the necessary information for the report to the Supreme Commander. The three of us got down to the work we had been commissioned to do early in the morning, and since we were fully in accord with one another, everything was ready by the evening. Besides all his other merits, Antonov had a brilliant gift for putting material into shape, and while Vasilevsky and I drafted the report for Stalin, he quickly drew up a map detailing the situation, a chart of operations on the fronts in the Kursk Bulge area. We all believed that proceeding from political, economic and military and strategical considerations, the Nazis would attempt, at any price, to retain their hold on the front stretching from the Gulf of Finland to the Azov Sea. They could fit out their own forces well in one of the strategical directions and make ready for a big offensive operation in the Kursk salient area, in an attempt to rout the forces of the Central and Voronezh fronts there. This could change the general strategical situation in favour of the German forces, not to mention the fact that, in these circumstances, the overall length of the front would be considerably shortened, and the general operational density of the German defence positions would be increased. The situation in this sector would make possible a two-pronged movement towards Kursk, one thrust from the area south of Orel and the other from the Belgorod area. It was assumed that the German commanding officers in the remaining sectors would carry out defensive operations, as, according to our general staff, there the Germans did not have necessary forces for offensive operations. In the evening of April 12th, I went to the GHQ with Vasilevsky and Antonov. The Supreme Commander listened to our views more attentively than ever before. He agreed that the main forces should be concentrated in the Kursk area, but, just as before, he was anxious about the Moscow sector. When discussing the plan for the operations at the Supreme Command GHQ, we came to the conclusion that it was imperative to build up stable defences, well organised in depth on all the most important sectors, and above all in the Kursk bulge area. In this connection, the commanding officers at the fronts were given the necessary instructions. The forces set about deeper entrenchment. It was decided not to involve in the operation for the time being the Supreme Command's strategical reserves that had been built up and got ready, but to concentrate them closer to the most dangerous sectors. Thus, by mid-April, the Supreme Command had already taken a preliminary decision on deliberate defence. The italics are mine. GG. True, we repeatedly returned to that question, 
but the final decision on deliberate defence was taken by the Supreme Command at the beginning of June 1943. At that time, the enemy's intention of launching a mighty offensive against the Voronezh and Central Fronts was in actual fact known. It was to involve the biggest tank groupings using the new Tiger and Panther tanks and the self-propelled Ferdinand guns. The Supreme Command considered the Voronezh, Central, Southwestern and Bryansk fronts to be the main ones involved in the action at the first stage in the summer campaign. According to our calculations, this was to be the main scene of action. We wanted to counter the expected offensive of the German forces with a powerful defence, to defeat them, and above all to crush the enemy tank groupings, and then, going over to a counter-offensive to rout the enemy at long last. Simultaneously with the plan for deliberate defence and counter-offensive, it was also decided to work out a plan for offensive operations, without waiting for the enemy offensive if he should postpone it for a long period. Thus our forces' defences were in no way necessitated, but purely deliberate ones, and depending on the situation, the Supreme Command was to choose the moment for going over to the offensive. It was borne in mind that things should not be done in too much of a hurry, nor should they be dragged out too much either. The italics are mine. G. G. At the same time, it was decided in which sectors the Supreme Command's main reserves should be concentrated. It was intended to deploy them in the Livni Stari Oskol Korotcha area, where defences were to be organised should the enemy break through in the Kursk Bulge area. Other reserves were to be stationed behind the right flank of the Bryansk front in the Kaluga Tula Yefremov area. The 5th Guards Tank Army and a number of other formations of the Supreme Command's reserves were to prepare for action beyond the junction of the Voronezh and southwestern fronts in the Liski area. Vasilevsky and Antonov were ordered to set about drawing up all the documents needed regarding the plan adopted, in order to discuss it yet again at the beginning of May. I was instructed to fly to the North Caucasian Front. Heavy action was being conducted there to annihilate the enemy's Taman grouping, the core of which was formed by the well-equipped 17th Army of the German forces. The elimination of the enemy on the Taman Peninsula was of great significance to the Soviet command. Besides destroying a big enemy grouping of 14 to 16 divisions, numbering approximately 180,000, 200,000 men in this sector, as a result of this operation, we liberated Novorossiysk. Since the first half of February, the heroic detachment of men of the 18th Army and the sailors of the Black Sea Fleet had been fighting here on a small bridgehead. People's Commissar for the Navy, N.G. Kuznetsov, Air Force Commander A.A. A. Novikov, General S. M. Stemenko of the General Staff, and I arrived at General Leselitzer's 18th Army. Once we had familiarised ourselves with the situation, forces and resources of the Army and the sailors of the Black Sea Fleet, we all came to the conclusion that it was impossible at that time to take any kind of big measures to extend the Novorossiysk bridgehead, which the troops used to call the Little Land. Indeed, that bridgehead was no more than 30 square kilometres in area all in all. At that time, there was one question that particularly worried us, namely whether the Soviet fighters would hold out in the face of the ordeals falling to their lot in an unequal struggle with the enemy who made air attacks on and subjected to artillery fire, the defenders of this little bridgehead day and night. We wanted to ask the advice of the head of the political department of the 18th Army, L.E. Brezhnev, about this. Brezhnev had been here numerous times and was familiar with the situation but at that moment he was on the little land where extremely fierce fighting was going on. From what the commander of the army, Leselidze, told us, it was clear that our forces were completely determined to fight the enemy until he was ultimately defeated and not allow themselves to be pushed into the sea. Having told Stalin my views, Stemenko and I set out for the 56th Army on the North Caucasian Front, which was commanded by General A. Agreshko at that time. At that moment, another offensive was planned in the area of the Cossack village of Krimskaya, but the army's commanding officers considered that they were not sufficiently prepared for it. They decided to postpone the attack, to bring up the ammunition and the artillery from the passive sectors of the front, and planned the best ways of using the aircraft and the Special People's Commissariat of Internal Affairs Division from the Supreme Command's reserves. At the same time, 
We also worked together with the commanding officers of the 18th Army. This army's landing party needed the support of the fleet and air attacks at Miskako on the enemy, who confronted the heroic members of the landing party. Before this, the 56th Army had fought a number of brilliant battles in which it had liberated the area around the River Kuban. Now it was to smash the enemy defences of the 17th Army in the area around Krimskaya and take the enemy's Novorossiysk grouping in the rear. It was further planned to combine the efforts of the forces on the front to eliminate the enemy's Taman bridgehead. The route of the enemy on the approaches to Krimskaya and its capture were assigned to the 56th Army alone, but its forces were limited, and neither the Supreme Command nor the front were seriously in a position to provide it with reinforcements. The army had to break through the strongly fortified defences that the German forces had set up on the approaches to the village. Greshko planned and made preparations for the operation expertly and with great foresight. The 56th Army's offensive on Krimskaya began on April 29th. In spite of the scarcity of its forces, especially aircraft, tanks and artillery, skillfully manoeuvring the means available, the army's commanding officers crushed the sustained resistance of the enemy defence. The troops of the 56th Army captured the village, an important railway junction, and pushed the enemy back beyond Krimskaya. Owing to the lack of resources, the 56th Army, like the other armies on the front, had to call off any further offensive. The offensive operations of the forces on the North Caucasian front in the area had to be postponed until a more auspicious moment presented itself. The party's Central Committee, the State Defence Committee, the Supreme Command, and the Commander-in-Chief were being actively engaged in a single objective, to rout the enemy at all costs in the near future. This meant preparing for a mighty blow at the enemy, which would be developed at the right moment by the Supreme Command's strategic reserves, the operational reserves of the fronts and the troops. At that time, we all shared a belief that the enemy had prepared a serious defensive system on the approaches to Stalingrad. The situation had become critical in that area. A sudden blow could easily cut down the supply routes, but any offensive without strategic reserves would be very dangerous. That's why we also worked on the front as best as we could. By that time, it had become clear that, besides taking advantage of the mistakes made by the German command and the effective use of our troops, we also needed to better coordinate our operations. All the commanding officers needed to work together without being afraid of difficulties. Only such joint efforts could help to achieve the objectives set. We thought that further setbacks could well follow at Stalingrad in the autumn-winter period. We also thought it would be possible to carry out a counter-offensive operation and, if necessary, to change our previous plans. During this time, the air forces had already used more than half of the strategic resources which the enemy had created. Our intelligence confirmed that the Germans had lost over 20 divisions. Such losses were often irreversible. They had lost men and materiel. The main thing was that the German command was finding it increasingly difficult to restore the situation and to carry out its own offensive plans. In early May, I arrived back in Moscow and brought with me the developments that had taken place on the North Caucasian front. The enemy was preparing to wreak vengeance for the defeat at Stalingrad. When they realised that their armed forces had lost their former superiority over the Red Army, the Nazi military and political leadership took total measures to send their best forces to the Soviet-German front. Picked troops were moved in from the west in large numbers. Working round the clock, the war industry hastened to produce the new Tiger and Panther tanks and the heavy self-propelled Ferdinand guns. The Air Force was supplied with Fokker Wolf 190A and Heinkel 129 aircraft. The German forces were considerably reinforced with personnel and materiel. On the Soviet-German front, Germany and its allies had 232 divisions, more than 5,300,000 men, more than 54,000 guns and mortars, 5,850 tanks and assault weapons, and approximately 3,000 combat planes. Staffs at all levels were intensively working on the plans for the forthcoming offensives. To conduct the operation planned against the Kursk salient, 
the Nazi command concentrated 50 of its best divisions, including 16 tank and motorised divisions, 11 tank battalions, and assault weapon divisions comprising up to 2,700 tanks and assault weapons, and more than 2,000 aircraft, almost 69% of all the combat planes on the Eastern Front. More than 900,000 men were ready for battle. The German commanding officers felt convinced of success. Nazi propaganda launched an all-out campaign to raise morale among the troops by promising certain victory in the impending battles. In the first half of May, I returned to the GHQ from the troops of the North Caucasian Front. At that time, the planning of the summer campaign at the General Staff was in the main being completed. The Supreme Command had carried out thorough intelligence and aerial reconnaissance, which had gained reliable information on the enemy flows of troops and ammunition towards the Orel, Kromi, Bryansk, Kharkov, Krasnograd and Poltava sectors. This confirmed the correctness of our forecasts in April. The Stavka and General Staff became increasingly of the opinion that the German forces might mount an offensive in the next few days. The Supreme Commander demanded that the Central, Bryansk, Voronezh and Southwestern Fronts be alerted to the fact that the forces on the fronts should be completely ready to meet an enemy offensive. On his orders, a Supreme Command directive was issued, in which provisions were made in the case of intensive enemy action. The expected offensive was to be halted by aircraft and artillery counter-preparation. In response to the Stavka's warning, the commanding officers at the fronts effected a series of fresh measures to intensify the system of fire and anti-tank defences and artificial obstacles. Here is one of the reports regarding this question sent in by the command of the Central Front. Stavka of the Supreme Command, for Comrade J. Stalin, re Supreme Command Directive of May 8, 1943. I hereby report 1. On receiving the Supreme Command Directive, all the armies and independent corps on the Central Front were ordered to have their troops ready for battle by the morning of May 10th. 2. Throughout May 9th and 10, a. The troops were told of the likelihood of an enemy offensive within the next few days. b. Units of the first and second echelons and of the reserve were made completely ready for battle. The commanding officers and staffs are inspecting troop readiness on the spot. c. Army reconnaissance and fire have been intensified within the army zones, especially on the Oral sector. In units of the first echelon, the reliability of coordinated fire is being checked in practice. The units of the second echelon and the reserve are doing additional reconnaissance in the directions of possible action, and are defining more precisely aspects of coordination with units of the first echelon. The ammunition stocks are being replenished at firing positions, Fortifications have been strengthened, especially on sectors where tanks may be used. Mines are being laid in depth in defence zones. The technical communications have been checked and found to operate faultlessly. 3. The 16th Air Army has stepped up aerial reconnaissance and is keeping the enemy under careful observation in the glazunovka orel kromi komariki area. Air formations and army units are ready to counter enemy air attacks, and put a stop to any possible enemy offensive operations. 4. To frustrate a possible enemy offensive on the Orel Kursk sector, counter preparations have been made involving the artillery of the 13th Army and the aircraft of the 16th Air Army. Rokossovsky, Telegin, Malinin. Very similar reports arrived from the other fronts. General of the Army Vatutin regarded the situation taking shape somewhat differently. Although he was not opposed to the defence measures, he suggested to the Supreme Commander that a forestalling blow should be struck at the enemy's Belgorod-Karkov grouping. In this, he had the full support of the military council member Khrushchev, Chief of the General Staff Vasilevsky, Antonov and other General Staff officers were not in favour of this proposal of the Voronezh Front Military Council. I concurred completely with the opinion of the General Staff and reported this to Stalin. The Supreme Commander himself was not yet certain whether it was better to counter the enemy with defensive operations or to deal a forestalling blow at him. Stalin was afraid that our defences could not take the German forces blow, as had been the case several times in 1941 and 1942. At the same time, 
he was not sure that our troops were in a position to defeat the enemy in offensive action. After repeated discussions, the Supreme Commander resolved to counter the German offensive with all kinds of depth echeloned defences, with mighty attacks from the air and counterblows from operational and strategic reserves. Then, once the enemy was exhausted and drained of his lifeblood, to strike at him with a telling counter-offensive on the Belgorod Kharkov and Orel sectors, followed by deep thrusts on all the major sectors. After defeating the Germans in the Kursk bulge area, the Supreme Command intended to liberate the Donbass, the whole of the left bank Ukraine, eliminate the enemy's bridgehead on the Taman Peninsula, liberate the eastern areas of Byelorussia, and create conditions for driving the enemy out of our territory completely.